Bonjour tout le monde, welcome everybody. Um, let me first apologize for, uh, we had a little technical problem with uh, the internet connection of our guest uh, today, of our speaker, but now it seems to be fixed. So our speaker is Marie Rognes. She's a chief research scientist in scientific uh, computing and numerical analysis at Stimula Research Laboratory in Norway, Oslo, and also professor at the Department of Mathematics in uh, Bergen. Okay. She has uh, been in uh, the Stimula Research Laboratory since 2009, and she has led the Department on Biomedical Computing. And uh, she's uh, currently uh, leading a number of projects on mathematical modeling, numerical methods for brain mechanics. In particular, she received an ERC starting grant uh, in this domain. She won a number of prizes, including the Wilkinson Prize for numerical software and the Royal Norwegian uh, Society of Science and Letter Prize for young researchers. So uh, it's uh, very nice to have you today with us, Marie. And uh, I leave you the room. The title of the talk is The Brain Numerical Waterscape. Please. Merci, merci beaucoup et merci aux organisateurs de m'avoir invité. Je suis ravie d'être ici. This talk is really about water. Water is uh, fundamental to life in so many different ways. For one, I think it's hard to overestimate the importance of water as a mode of transport, our oceans, our rivers, um, and its importance in human history and culture. But on the other hand, what remains nearly surprisingly enigmatic is the waterways of the brain. Your brain is composed of soft intertangled tissue and it's nearly 80% water. But these waterways of the brain uh, and how they enable transport in and out of the brain uh, really remains a mystery. So in very blunt terms, we really do not understand how stuff gets into and out of the brain itself. So for one, the brain lacks a um, traditional lymphatic system and the entire rest of your body, you have lymphatic vessels and a lymphatic system that serves many roles, but one of the roles is to transport solutes out of the tissue and out of the body. But there are no lymphatic vessels in the brain itself. So considering that the brain uses about 20% of the body's metabolism, this lack of some kind of clearance, uh, of a traditional clearance system is puzzling. Now, on the other hand, um, there's also the blood-brain barrier if you inject a substance like a um, contrast agent, a so-called tracer into your bloodstream, that tracer or contrast agent will likely reach almost your entire body, but not your brain. This is because of this blood brain barrier that acts as tight junctions surrounding the blood vessels in the brain, not allowing substances, at least not large molecules, to move from the blood into the brain tissue. So uh, like many of us these days, the brain exists in some form of kind of isolation or some form of quarantine and probably has very different modes of transport in and out of the brain and the rest of the body. So this is the fundamental question that I'm and my research team are addressing. Is there kind of a pathway for substances from the body into the brain, similar to the lymphatic system? Uh, and the interesting answer to this is that, well, the interesting bit is that nobody knows the answer to this. This is a complete mystery. This is something that we really do not understand in the physiology. Now, why is this at all important? Well, what you're looking at here is an illustration of brain um, tissue. It's an illustration of so-called protein aggregates uh, in and between brain cells. The brown bits are amyloid beta plaques and the blue bits are so-called tau tangles. These are both kind of lumps of protein fragments 
uh, that accumulate and are hallmark of neurodegenerative diseases, like, for instance, Alzheimer's disease uh, and other uh, related diseases. So we do not understand how these protein aggregates form, but our ultimate vision in kind of a, in a decades perspective is to imagine that better understanding of the brain's waterways of brain influx and brain clearance could give us a better understanding uh, of uh, diagnosing and treatment neurodegenerative and neurological disorders. And of course, our idea is that mathematical modeling and simulation um, can provide us a new or complementary avenue attack to understand these diseases. So this is a talk in two parts. I first want to show you how brain physiology can benefit from mathematical modeling. And then I want to look at the dual perspective. How can applied mathematics benefit from brain physiology? What type of interesting problem settings uh, does brain physiology provide with us? So the first thing I want to do is to uh, give an introduction to the brain's waterscape or brain fatigues and show some computational studies. And then I'll look at examples at two different scales, the poroelastic brain and the interplay between electrochemistry and mechanics at the micro scale in the end. But let me first tell you a bit about what we know and what we do not know of the brain's waterscape. And I'll start with a kind of 101 uh, introduction to brain anatomy. So let me just flip a few slides back. So let's look at this mouse brain. So here we have a mouse, we have the brain of a mouse. Uh, the mouse brain is of course different, but it's in many ways same, same as the human brain. The light per bits here is the brain and the brain is surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid. This is a water-like fluid that surrounds the brain. And there's also deep cavities kind of deep within the brain, so-called ventricles, that are also filled with cerebrospinal fluid. The brain is connected to the spinal cord, which goes down um, kind of the back in the mice and down our spine in humans. The brain is surrounded by three membranes, the outermost and thickest. So this here on the right is a cross section from this here in A. You have the outer skull, and then you have the so-called dura membrane, which is a thick membrane. And inside the dura, you have the so-called arachnoid membrane. And innermost towards the brain parenchyma itself, you have the so-called pia membrane. And in between the arachnoid membrane and this pia membrane, you have the so-called subarachnoid space, the SAS, and it's filled with cerebrospinal fluid, S uh, CSF. Blood vessels uh, are key here. They line the brain, so they follow the surface of the brain up from the neck, and they also dive into the brain tissue. And it's conjectured that around these um, blood vessels, both on the surface of the brain and as the day dive into the brain, the vessels are surrounded by so-called perivascular spaces. <clears throat> so I think those are kind of those are the most important things to be aware of uh, here in the brain anatomy as we see it. <clears throat> so recall that. Due to the blood brain barrier, a contrast agent or a tracer injected into the blood will not spread into the brain. But how do something do get into the brain is that if you inject this tracer, this dye, into the cerebrospinal fluid surrounding the brain, for instance, down here in C3 in the spinal cord, that dye or contrast agent will slowly move up in the cerebrospinal fluid. And after some hours, it will reach the outer surface of the brain, and it will start spreading into the brain in the course of hours and days. And then somehow in the course after maybe a few days or up to four weeks, that substance is somehow cleared from the brain again. So these are human data of injected tracers that are injected into the spinal cord and then visualized using uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And they're from essentially the one team of clinical um, uh, staff uh, in the world that has this as a part of their um, clinical routine. So these are quite unique data. These are collaborators 
Per Christian Eide and Geirin Stad at Oslo University Hospital. So what is more standard, but still really on the frontier of experimental research, is to study these pathways via um, animal experiments in cats, rats, typically mice, some even in alligators. Uh, and in animals, it's much more easy and it's much more ethical to manipulate these pathways. And as in humans, if you inject a tracer into these CSF-filled spaces surrounding the brain, um, the brain will eventually move into the brain itself. And it seems that the, brain, uh, the tracer will follow, you, follow designated spaces. It looks like the influx of tracer follows the blood vessels. So he is you a uh, cross sections at different layers in the brain. This is on the surface and this is deeper within. And the green bit here is the tracer. And as I image it, it first starts on the surface and then over time it starts following these blood vessels and also start diving into the parenchyma. So these spaces are designated perivascular spaces, and this perivascular flow is believed to be key, a key mechanism in brain influx. But this is not known, and it's all very, uh, it's all very um, uh, experimental, and it's hypothesis based, and little consensus has been reached. So let's look at some factors that influence this pathway, and this is namely some fun facts. So. Sleep enhances the pathway. So tracer spreads faster in the brain of mice that sleep than those that are awake. And this is a rather intriguing uh, aspect, I think. And tracers move faster with um, exercise. So well-exercised mice uh, have faster influx than uh, uh, the couch potato mice. And here's another interesting aspect. A moderate amount of alcohol also enhances this pathway. So uh, traces spread faster in the brains of slightly intoxicated mice, but there was a clear limit to the, to the amount of alcohol that would uh, enhance the pathway. So this fluid and tracer pathway between the body and the brain, and perhaps back again, seems to be linked to a number of these lifestyle factors that we also know are uh, associated with diseases like dementia and uh, like stroke. So when I started reading about this topic in 2013, I, I thought that this was very intriguing. And um, after reading a few of these papers, I thought I had a really good idea what was going on. And I still think that this is incredibly intriguing, but um, I was completely wrong regarding why and the general level of understanding and consensus here. And the field is filled with uh, controversy. It's filled with conflicting findings. And it really is quite a culture shock when you come as an applied mathematician and you meet this field where almost nobody seems to agree uh, upon what's going on. There are big open questions, uh, including are the forces and spaces uh, sufficient to create effective uh, transport pathways? What would be the mechanisms underlying influx and clearance in the brain and brain environment? Um, and also what's the link between clearance and the neurological disease? So I'll try to answer the, provide some answers to the first two questions today. And we address these clear questions via what we call computational brain fatigues. Uh, and when I say we, I really mean my wonderful team here at Simler Research Lab, our collaborators at Oslo University Hospital um, in Oxford and other places. So with that, I'm going to look at three concrete open physiology questions that we provide new answers to via uh, mathematical modeling and simulation. The first one is, are the pressure gradients in the brain? And two, if yes, what fluid flow magnitudes would such gradients uh, induce around the brain and inside the brain? And three, what are the dominant mechanisms for tracer transport inside the brain? So let's start by looking at the natural forces in and around the brain. To measure the forces, or more precisely, the intracranial pressure, the ICP, one can insert a pressure sensor inside uh, the brain itself, or what I think is more common into some of these fluid compartments, into the ventricles, 
here or just below the dura. As you can imagine, this is a rather invasive procedure. Um, so recordings of pressure, um, intracranial pressure is actually quite rare. Um, even more rare is direct recordings of um, simultaneous recordings of pressures at different places within the cranium. So that means that we know very little of the spatial pressure gradients and the existence of pulsatile or steady pressure gradients in the brain is, remains um, a surprising, uh, surprisingly debated. Uh, this has probably been a debate for a century and it's still not really concluded. So here in Oslo, we've been extremely fortunate and have obtained what I think is a nearly unique set of simultaneous pressure recordings in dementia patients and in a group of cohorts. Um, and I'll show you some of these uh, key characteristics of those data. So in short, the pressure inside your brain pulsates. It pulsates in sync with your uh, body. It pulsates in sync with your heartbeat. It pulsates in sync with your breathing. And the amplitude of these pressure oscillations is, as you can see here, maybe typically somewhere between four uh, and 10 millimeters in mercury. Um, and that's, this is quite well known. So um, here you can see recordings on top from the ventricles and here on the bottom from the subdural uh, measurements. And you can see that they are very similar. There seems to be a small and persistent difference between these two. So we had access to up to, here you can see 10 seconds, uh, but we had access to about 24 hours of recordings of these signals in 10 patients uh, in these two different locations. Um, and by analyzing these recordings, we found um, pulsatile but persistent pressure differences um, of around 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 millimeters of mercury and that would translate to pressure gradients around one to two millimeters of mercury per meter. After computing the power spectra of these signals, we would find two dominant frequency, one corresponding to the cardiac cycle around one hertz, and one likely due to respiration of around 0.3 hertz. And approximating these two contributions as the whole contribution, we would, um, and then kind of essentially estimating, uh, approximating the pressure difference by the sum uh, of signs, um, we would find a cardiac amplitude, a C of around one to two millimeters of mercury per meter and a respiratory amplitude around 0 0.5 to one millimeters of mercury per meter. So this tells us something about the natural magnitude of pressure differences in brain tissue. Note that these are pulsatile pressure differences and we can't really say anything about the presence of steady um, or static pressure differences with the measurements that we have. We can now move on and say, now that we have information uh, of this magnitude of these pressure differences, what type of flow can these gradients induce? In particular, we can start by looking at um, induced CSF, cerebrospinal fluid flow, and CSF is essentially water, so we can estimate um, the flow of water induced by these pressure gradients using the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. And let me just first, we can first look at an idealized scenario. Let's see if I can go back one step here and say that we'll first look kind of at an idealized scenario where we look at the flow in a pipe, in a rigid pipe. A pipe is a decent kind of um, approximation of several parts of the CSF system, but in particular of the aqueduct, which is the narrow channel between the so-called third and fourth ventricle here. This is very pipe-like, and it's also a good place because it's a place where they can measure the CSF flow non-invasively. Um, and if we consider this uh, simple axisymmetric pipe approximation, we can also compute uh, analytically um, with this given sinusoidal pressure condition, a peak flux and the peak stroke volume induced by the cardiac component, AC and BC, and the respiratory component, AR and VR. So that's the largest flux and also the, amount, the stroke volume represents the amount of fluid that's moved in one half cycle. 
And what we find is that these idealized pressure gradients um, of one to two millimeters of mercury um, per meter, the peak would induce fluxes of around a milliliter per second, which this is an agreement with um, what's expected. And it's also interesting that while the pressure gradients, which are plotted on the top here, is clearly dominated by the cardiac frequency, you see that the amplitude of the cardiac frequency is larger than that of the longer wavelength respiration. And for the fluxes, the contributions balance out. So you have both contributions, nearly equal contributions from the cardiac and the respiratory cycle. And these idealized observations translate to the clinic. Um, so we can also solve these 3D Navier-Stokes equations in these patient-specific aqueducts, where they'll have the natural variation and the differences in, in profiles. And again, we observe a positive flow uh, with both cardiac and respiratory contributions. They're comparable for the peak flux, but due to the longer period of the respiratory cycle, the respiratory contribution will um, kind of, um, dominate for the, the fluid mood. And this is a very useful insight clinically because it tells, it, it reconciles a much debate of the importance with, of cardiac versus respiratory components. And it also points that you need to do measurements that include the respiratory component and not just filter on the cardiac frequency. So with that, let me move to some uh, examine smaller spaces. We can look at perivascular flow. So flow in perivascular spaces is really one of these key concepts that's involved in theories concerning influx and clearance from the brain. I think the core idea is that instead of a separate lymphatic vessel system, the spaces surrounding the blood vessels almost act as a, as a replacement for these traditional lymphatic vessels. At least that's the, that's the theory. And experimentalists have demonstrated that microparticles move along um, blood vessels. This is on the surface. And what you're looking at here is, is an average flow speed of particles. And it moves up to maybe around 40 micrometers per second. Now this may seem rather slow, but in these cramped and tortuous spaces, that is practically warp speed compared to anything else here. And they observed that the particle motion, uh, it's back and forth and it is uh, synchronized with the cardiac pulsations, in particular with the pulsations of the nearby blood vessel wall. And these observations have led to a now very popular, uh, but I would say dubious hypothesis that arterial wall motion is the principal driving mechanism of CSF flow in perivascular spaces, via what they call so-called perivascular pumping. So we wanted to test that hypothesis via modeling and simulation. So we created a model of a sample perivascular space by taking an image of a human artery, a surface artery. We defined a perivascular space surrounding this artery by extruding the domain. And we considered the simulation of Stokes equations in this perivascular space uh, induced by the movement of the inner wall. And the physiologically realistic movement of the inner wall here um, from the experiments, we do know something about it uh, uh, in time, uh, but in space, one needs to extrapolate based on, for instance, the wave speed of blood. And the wave speed of blood is around one meter per second. So the effect of that is that the expansion of the inner wall here is nearly synchronized uh, in space. And as a result, the resulting flow will look something like this. So, the wall will expand and track nearly simultaneously everywhere. Fluid will be pushed out at both ends um, and the flow will be laminar. Um, and importantly, this, there's not really um, any net movement of fluid, any net flow being induced by this type of pattern. And then there needs to be some kind of net flow in order for uh, this to be an important mechanism in. Um, solid transport. Um, so we went uh, a step further 
uh, as well and wanted to say something about well what if it's not these arterial pulsations that generate any net flow what could it be we looked at other press uh, pulsatile pressure contributions from the gradients that we've uh, just identified uh, but pulsatile pressure gradients at both ends here do not really induce any net flow either um, but the the simple explanation of the possible presence of a, a static pressure gradient of a steady magnitude comparable to those pressure, uh, pulsatile pressure gradients we have observed, maybe one to two millimeters of mercury per meter would give rise to, um, to um, particle motion in line with the experiments. So we instead suggest and suggest to the physiologists that perivascular fluid flow is partly a result of arterial wall motion, but there must also be a persistent static pressure gradient. So up until now, I've just surfed on the brain surface. So we've examined the CSF field spaces surrounding the brain, uh, and let me dive into the brain. So, and recall that if you have a tracer that's injected in the spinal column, it will somehow spread to your entire brain in the course of around 24 hours. And then somehow it'll totally vanish in the course of days or weeks. And the really the big question in this field, or the holy grail, if you like, is what are the biophysical mechanisms underlying the flux of tracer into and out of the brain? And uh, medical doctors claim that it's unlikely that diffusion alone explains this braid wide distribution. And again, that's a claim uh, we can examine. So clearly tracers do move in the brain by diffusion. And the real question is whether there are other mechanisms at play. And the dominant theory in this community is that there's also an element of convection, either in these perivascular spaces within the brain or also in extracellular spaces. But really this is much disputed with uh, opposing camps. And an additional confounding aspect is that there's substantial uncertainty in all the parameter values here. Um, such as the effective um, diffusion coefficient or uh, the effective permeability in these different networks. But again, unfortunately, this is something um, kind of uh, physics and uncertainty is something we can test, right? So we wanted to test whether it was unlikely that diffusion alone would explain the brain-wide distribution observed and what likely tracer distributions that could result from diffusion and or some forms of convection. So we created these families of brain models, and from the um, medical images, we estimated the concentration of tracer um, on the surf, uh, boundary of the brain over time. Uh, and then we set that as a boundary condition for different uh, diffusion and convection uh, models. And we represented the diffusion coefficients and velocity coefficients as random fields. Uh, and then drawing samples using Monte different Monte Carlo techniques, we estimated these clinically relevant quantities, including the total amount of tracer in the outermost part of the brain, the gray matter, total amount of tracer in the inner, inner parts of the brain, the deep white matter, and also average concentrations. So what did we find? Well, we started by just simulating the diffusion of this tracer gadubitrol alone from the brain surface and into the brain. Um, and trace will first spread up from below over the entire convexity of the brain and then slowly spread into the brain. And we observed that the um, expected amount of tracer in the gray matter would peak in about 15 hours, while the amount of tracer in the deeper regions uh, would still be increasing after 24 hours. But this uncertainty in the diffusion coefficient really, really um, is a dominant source of uncertainty in these outputs. And the observations in gray matter is within what's observed clinically uh, in the experiments. So that means that diffusion can, to a very large extent, explain these findings least in the gray matter, but maybe that there's a small deviation, a small contribution from something else, and in particular in the deeper regions. So I could go a bit more into 
this, but I think I'll be quite quick and just say that there can be fluid velocities that can affect the flow here. But I wanted to move on uh, a bit. So I wanted to say something, move into this different perspective where I'm rather looking at, instead of answering physiological questions, I like to see what type of interesting mathematical problem settings these, uh, um, this setting offers. And in particular, what we need to do is, is kind of to uh, connect the dots. How do we connect from extracranial sources or forces to intracranial pressures and fluid velocities? And I'll start by looking at this at the macro scale. So looking at the whole brain and looking at the brain as a plastic medium. The brain is a, maybe not surprisingly, but it's really in many ways a very complex organ, even just from the mechanical viewpoint. Brain tissue is one of the softest tissues in the body. It's nonlinear, it's viscoelastic, it is, brain tissue is very much fluid and it's poroelastic and it varies with region, so it's heterogeneous. But that the scales we're interested in here, if we're looking at the brain at the organ level and if we're looking at time scales of from in a seconds to days, it really is the poor elastic kind of regime that's the most relevant. Now, poor elastic materials are often well described by Bios equations. So Bios equations describe an elastic medium filled uh, with a fluid in a network. Um, our classical and much studied equations uh, and the equations describe the displacement of the tissue U and the pore pressure or the fluid pressure P, such the balance of momentum and balance of mass holds. So the components here in the balance of momentum is there's an elastic part and there's a fluid pressure part. And the balance of mass uh, equation essentially says that the change in volume is proportional to the movement of the fluid. And what makes Biot's equations so interesting is that there's a number of interesting parameter regimes, I would say. So first, we have the incompressible regime that if you're in the case where you're also in low storage, so this coefficient C0, 0, it drops out, but lambda is very big. This system decouples and you're left with a Darcy type equation here and an elasticity type equation. In addition, which is also very relevant in brain tissues, the so-called impermeable regime, where K becomes very small, so there's very little fluid transport in the fluid network. And in this case, uh, these equations reduce to a Stokes type of system. So as you can imagine, this means that Bios equations are fraught with many of the same challenges and many more as well as, as these types of systems. And accurately solving Bios equations is is a kind of a well-known and challenging problem. Now, the, in the brain, the more appropriate is to look at the generalization of a Biot's equations. The brain is elastic, but it's uh, permeated by multiple fluid networks. In addition to the extracellular space filled with water-like fluid, you also have blood, and you have very different kind of characteristics for the capillary versus the larger artery blood network. So one should really, in order to represent the interactions at the macro scale brain, one should consider a generalized um, theory. Now, fortunately, such a theory exists, the multiple network poroelastic theory, and that it's a macroscopic model for representing poroelastic model where there's multiple interacting fluid networks. So for instance, you can have a small scale pore network and a larger scale fracture networks and there can be fluid moving in each of these networks, but also being exchanged between the networks. And this is exactly the setting that we are in in the work. So the, these multiple network uh, elastic, uh, paralysticity equations generalize Biot's equation. So again, we're interested in finding a displacement U and a set of pressures, Pj, J of these. J can be anywhere between one and 10. Um, and this corresponds to the different fluid networks. And again, we have balance of momentum and balance of mass that holds. Now, 
you have the sum of the fluid pressures here, and you have a transfer term between the fluid networks. This is essentially the main thing that extends this from Beal's equations. Again, we have a number of interesting regimes, and particularly in the brain, it's near considered nearly incompressible. So lambda is likely large. Transfer coefficients are like much unknown. Some of them are small, some of them can be large, and some of the networks you will also have very low permeability. So we're fraught with all of these uh, challenging uh, parameter regimes. Now, if you consider if you consider um, this, um, these equations in this form, you get this uh, natural block structure. So I introduced some notation here. So P is just the uh, list of my fluid pressures, P1 to Pj. Alphas are coefficients, so-called Biot-Willis coefficients between zero and one. And then you get this natural block structure where you have an elasticity contribution, uh, the grad div, so with a time derivative, and the low, um, another diagonal block for P. And if you discretize this in a, in a relatively really straightforward way with finite element methods, you approximate, for instance, U with MP with um, something Tiller Hood type. And you consider a smooth chase case um, with moderately high lambdas, not too high, but moderately high. You still very easily observe uh, a loss of convergence. For instance, in uh, in the um, in the displacement and also like in the pressure variables. Now this is clearly suboptimal. What are good ways uh, to remedy this? So I think my in practice and in theory favorite approach these days is to introduce um, the total pressure. So this is an approach introduced, I think, by Ruiz Bayer and studied in the context of preconditioning by Lee Martel and Winter for Bios equations. And what he introduced is a pressure that is the combination of the solid pressure and the weighted fluid pressures. By introducing this variable, you can transform this block system uh, into this uh, three, uh, uh, well, it's many more than three fields, but kind of three uh, block structure now with U, P0, and P. And you will see as lambda goes to infinity, these uh, purple blocks here will drop and you'll have a well post system uh, even in that incomp uh, incompressible limit. So that was, that was a bit rough, but one can also prove this. So for considering uh, the continuous variational formulation of these AMPAT equations where we're looking for a U in H1, a P0 in L2 and Pj in, uh, in H1 uh, for each time. And you look at the natural variational formulation at the continuous level, here the brackets denote the L2 inner product or dual covering. Um, and we do a conforming semi-discrete variational formulation replacing these and Qs uh, with discrete spaces. One can prove that this will converge provided some reasonable assumptions on these values. So for instance, a key assumption would be that Bh and Q0h is a stop stable element pair in the Bretzi sense. And then this Qjh um, should be an H-conforming uh, uh, discrete space that converges for elliptic type problems. Uh, but given these uh, assumptions, one can prove, um, kind of, uh, um, well, without those, we can also prove uh, energy estimates, but also semi-discrete error estimates. And in particular for Taylor Hood type elements, where um, U is discretized by order uh, L uh, plus one, P0 is discretized by order L and maybe order L for a normal degree also for the other pressures, they'll get out um, the expected um, um, convergence rates. Uh, and uh, the, error, the lower order in the uh, pressures Pj will not necessarily pollute the error in U. And we can also look at this um, numerically uh, corroborating these theoretical findings. And in these examples, we also see that we retain the uh, L2 rates for U, a uh, higher order, um, though we have not proven that. 
Okay, so I want to touch upon this last topic uh, for uh, maybe five to 10 minutes. My last topic is regarding the bridge between brain electrochemistry and mechanics. And the main bridge between electro brain electrochemistry, so brain activity, function, and signaling, uh, signaling, and the mechanics lies with the ions. So ions, ion concentrations, and ion concentration differences is really the foundations for brain signaling. Uh, differences in ion concentration lead to charge differences and also lead to this action potential of the main kind of signaling pathway of the brain. But on the other hand, movement of ions between the intracellular and extracellular spaces uh, lead to differences in ion concentration, which also is kind of the underlying osmosis. So we will also have water movement and cellular swelling associated with movements of ion concentration. So this is a, here you have a link between the, the electrical activity and the signaling of the brain and the brain mechanics. And these ion uh, concentrations, in particular the ion concentrations outside the cells in the extracellular space changes with brain states. So there's changes between sleep wakefulness, uh, brain activity, uh, and then you have these kind of extreme pathological cases with seizures and so-called cortical spreading depression. And of course, we are really interested, I'm, so my, I'm looking at the waters and then in the physiological states, so I'm really interested in looking at how these ion concentrations affect the water flow during sleep and wakefulness. This is really tricky to study. So what we started with was looking at these extreme cases first, looking at, um, cortical spreading depression. So let me say a bit more about cortical spreading depression. So cortical spreading depression is a phenomenon observed in connection with uh, 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 migraine, aura, uh, and also um, seizures. It manifests as a slowly propagating wave of depolarization of the brain cells. And it's much studied as this fundamental pattern that where one tries to understand underlying mechanisms um, in order to understand other nervous system physiology uh, aspects. And as everything I've discussed today, there's in the physiological community, there is substantial controversy regarding the mechanisms at play. So when I started looking at this in, in 2016, we found this beautiful framework uh, for modeling uh, brain ion and fluid movement by Yoshiro Mori, uh, published in, in 2015. And there's also other works in this uh, direction, some recent work uh, by Xu et al. And this is an absolutely beautiful model for exactly simulating uh, what we're interested in here. So let me just first show you this uh, illustration on the right here is an illustration of, of brain tissue. The black bits here is the extracellular space and everything else is different cells. So this is about a one micrometer. Um, so maybe this is a 10 micrometer bit, but we're interested in looking at this is at a slightly higher level. So we're gonna zoom out. I'm gonna look at a homogenized model. And we're interested in looking at a homogenized domain over there with a set of compartments. The compartments will likely in the brain will be extracellular, neuron and glial compartments. And we're interested in uh, looking at a number of ion species. The typical ion species is sodium, uh, Ni+, potassium, K+, chloride, uh, and glutamate, and others, but these are the most important ones. So we'll assume that uh, each compartment exists everywhere. Uh, each ion species exists everywhere. Um, and we are interested for each compartment and ion species in finding its concentration the electrical potentials induced by movements of these ions in each compartment and the induced um, changes in the volume of these compartments. And that's represented by volume fractions, alpha R. So recall that we, if these ions move, the water will follow. And if you have water going out from one cell, the cell may shrink and the extracellular space may so that's the origination with this volume fraction. 
And it's assumed that all of the communication in the model, partly for simplicity, I think, is that all communication happens via the extracellular space. So in addition, the model includes, uh, let's see, hydrostatic pressures and fluid velocities, but I'll not go into these here. But for these three first types of fields, uh, the framework uh, is based on kind of three principles or three, uh, uh, yep. First is that the change in the cell volume is proportional to the water movement across the cell membrane. And then ions will move by different forces, by diffusion, by electrical forces and across the cell membrane. And also we assume bulk electroneutrality. <clears throat> so the first uh, relation says that the change in volume fraction is proportional to the water movement W and that uh, across, the, across the membranes and that water movement across the membrane is driven by osmotic pressure difference, so a difference between the ion concentrations. Next, the ions will move, so the change in the ion concentrations is due to diffusion and electrical forces and movement across the cell membranes. Um, and here JK, so that's the movement inside the compartment, is given by this change, uh, gradients of the concentrations and the drift in the electric field. These transmembrane ion fluxes here, J, K, R, E, look very innocuous here, they said, but this is typically subject to modeling and may involve like a um, large number of ODs for describing the mechanisms in the membrane. And in addition, an assumption of electroneutrality gives you, uh, um, there are many, many different ways of formulating that. This is one. We're considering using this model uh, to consider uh, simulations of cortical spreading depression in a simple kind of one dimensional domain representing a part of the brain surface. And in the lab, these cerebrospinal, uh, sorry, um, cortical spreading depression can be induced in many different ways. Uh, and we are able to successfully use all of these ways to also induce CSD in the model. So this is a sample of what this will look like. So the upper plot are um, uh, unknowns over, um, over space, over the domain, and here the same unknowns over time. So you will have this wave, to a quite dramatic wave, and it will move through the tissue. You will also have large changes uh, in the cellular volumes, and you will have large changes in the concentrations and in the potentials. And we can then use this model to study different um, effect on the CCD from changes in the membrane mechanisms. And we've compared this with experiments and our values are reasonable and we can test things that would take them typically four years to test in a lab, including growing the mice and waiting for the mice and, and so on. So this is proving to be very effective. The one, the one thing that they're really interested in is the wave speed of how fast this wave moves through the tissue. And this is where uh, this becomes kind of numerically interesting because from discretizing uh, these equations and this phenomena, for instance, kind of using a second order strength splitting, uh, second order time discretization of the PDEs, higher order OD methods, and then we just want to determine a number of elements n in space, and the time step of delta t, you can see the predicted mean wave speed here for these different time step and resolutions. And as you can see, this varies by from four to 10. And maybe the right um, uh, answer is, is somewhere around 5.1. But you typically need at least that accuracy for it to be valuable to the experimentalists. And note that this is a rather fine resolution space. We're looking at a 1D domain. It's one centimeter long. So we've, we've tried to um, investigate this uh, numerically. Um, our main conclusion so far, it's very hard to harvest benefits from higher order methods uh, for now. Uh, we've tested different splitting schemes, spatial discretizations, OD discretizations, and so on. But if you have better suggestions, I'm very open uh, for other suggestions. So with that, uh, I think I'll stop there. Let me thank my 
collaborators uh, and you for the attention. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so we can, uh, the, the room is open for, uh, for questions. Uh, you should uh, raise uh, your hand and maybe while people think of question, I have a first one. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, in the end of the second part that one of the uh, one of the problem, one of the issue was the uncertainty on the diffusion coefficient. Do you have a way of modeling this uncertainty? Um, I mean, what, what, what kind of tool are you using, in fact, for this? So we considered, um, let me just go back to where you, what you're asking. Um, yeah. Some, somehow, yes. yeah. Yeah. Here, yes. So uh, we, we did model the uncertainty in the diffusion coefficients. We considered uh, two, uh, two representations. First, we just considered a, a constant diffusion coefficient that looked at its magnitude. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, let me see if I have the details here somewhere. Sorry, no. Um, and then um, we also considered heterogeneous uh, uh, representations as random, uh, random fields. As random fields, yes. Yeah. Do you have information on the covariance of these fields? I mean, do you have? A, can you do statistical inference one way or another to get some uh, some parameters uh, here? So here, it, it's where I think we use these matern uh, fields. Oh yeah, matern. Um, so it's very mathematical. Yeah. So it's very it's very uh, mathematical on these fields, but you do have quite a bit of data uh, on these. In individual patients, you have a diffusion tensor uh, imaging will give you maps of these uh, diffusion uh, tensors in patients and their regional uh, distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're considering kind of individual individual. Uh, so kind of patient-specific simulations, then you could use that as information. But I'm not sure if it's much as kind of uh, uh, that well known on the group level. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions, please. Okay, Benoit uh, Pertam, please go ahead. I don't know if I have to unmute. Oh, you can unmute yourself. Yes, Maria, I, I did not understand very well this uh, the motivation for this uh, network. Uh, model because the position x is the same everywhere so what what is behind the, this network uh, these different pressures in this network right so this is also thanks for asking so this you have again this homogenized model where you imagine that all of the networks exist everywhere mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, this is a typical kind of, in a way, uh, spatial but compartment type models uh, that you often have mm -hmm. in biology in the, in the bi-domain equations, for instance. You imagine that you have intracellular and extracellular spaces everywhere. And here for the pressures, you imagine that all of these networks exist everywhere um, because you've zoomed out so far that you're unable to see the differences. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So, so, I, so if there are no other questions, I had another one, uh, which is about, uh, which is not connected to your talk, which is general questions. Uh, many people suffer from, uh, from headache, which come back. And I understood that comes from, uh, from uh, disorder in the free pressure or something like that. Uh, do you know something about that? So I, I think headaches have many different courses, but some of these are definitely associated with um, um, kind of abnormalities in the fluid pressure. You, for instance, have something called uh, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, I think. So this means that your pressure in the head is a bit uh, high, and that's typically associated with, uh, with migraines and headaches. It's kind of one of uh, the hallmark features there. So there, there are also the precisely these um, medical doctors who are collaborating with 
there are also kind of trying to use this simulations of the fluid mechanics to understand that part. Mm -hmm. And then this cortical spreading depression, which is more on the, on the electrophysiology side, is also associated with, with kind of uh, migraine, uh, for instance. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay. So if no other question, I would like to thank Marie again. Thank you very much. And uh, so see you uh, everyone for the next seminar. We, we stop here, but you can of course stay and, uh, and have more informal discussions.